Repeat after me. Say, I am a hearer, a reader, and a doer of God's word. Let's proclaim that again. See, the pastor was all in the vine with declarations. Amen. So let's declare something else again. Say, I am a hearer, a reader, and a doer of God's word. Amen. And if you really are, give God praise for that. And that's what we've come to do tonight. We've come to hear God's word. We've come to read God's word. And after we leave here, we want to apply what we have learned. Amen. Because we are going what? We're going where? We are going higher. Okay, so we are going to continue in our study on the book of Proverbs. And tonight we are going to begin chapter 10. I anticipate that chapter 10 will take about three to four weeks to get through. (laughs) and so on tonight we're going to deal with part four as we all know well most of us should know this is an interactive bible study so as we go through the lesson if you do have a question or a comment please make sure that you raise your hand and use the microphone so that our online viewers can hear what you're saying we also encourage everybody to read ahead so that when we come in on Thursday nights, we all can have an intellectual discussion or conversation on what God has ministered to us. And we can learn from one another. Is that all right? Because it's not just about the person with the title. It's not just about the person that is up teaching, but we can all learn something from one another. The moment we act like we've got it all together, that is a major problem. The moment we act like that we cannot receive from somebody else, that is a major problem. We should always be in a state of learning and coming into the knowledge of the truth. So with that being said, let's go ahead and jump into Proverbs chapter 10. As stated before, Proverbs chapter 10 will probably take us about three to four weeks to get through. It is broken down into four main themes. Now, some of you Bible scholars and theologians may have more than that, but based on the study that I did that Yahweh allowed me to participate in, I came up with four predominant themes in the book of chapter 10. So theme number one deals with the wise and the foolish. And I'm jumping ahead. Let me um, go ahead and pass out the materials. I want everyone to pass this around and take out a couple sheets of paper, however many you feel like you'll need. And there's a pen if you need a pen as well. Because what we're going to do is we're going to take some notes tonight. Is that all right? You know, sometimes our brain is really good. You know, the Lord made us with a good capacity to remember things. But we are human, so we can't forget what we hear. So tonight, we are going to take some notes, and nobody's going to have any excuse as to why they couldn't take notes, because guess what? Materials is being provided to you. (laughs) So let's bless God for new hope in Christ. (laughs) Amen. Even the young people, you, you all can take some paper and some pens as well. That way, you don't have no temptation not to pay attention during Bible study. Amen. Amen. The mothers and the parents are like, that's right, that's right, that's right. Y'all still ready for Bible study? Okay, got to keep y'all awake. I already see somebody nodding or looking like they bored. (laughs) Not up in here. (laughs) Okay, so everybody has supplies. We're ready to go. Okay, even those of you that are watching online, we do encourage you to participate. So if you have a moment to go grab some pen and paper, that will be great. So we are getting ready to study the book of Proverbs chapter 10. The four themes are this, and you can write this down. Theme number one deals with the wise and the foolish. the wise and the foolish. Theme number two deals with money matters and work ethics. Money matters 
and work ethics. Theme number three deals with character. Character. And theme number four, I simply like to call it, watch your mouth. Watch your mouth. And that's theme number four. So we've got the wise and the foolish, number one. Number two, money matters and work ethics. Number three, character. And number four, watch your mouth. Okay, so here's something else that will probably be good to write down. For theme number one, the wise and the foolish, that is covered in verses one through three, verses six to eight, verse 16, verse 23 through 25, verse 27, through 28 and verse 30. I'll go over that again in case I was moving a little bit too fast. So the wise and the foolish is covered in verses one through three, six through eight, 16, 23 through 25, 27 through 28, and verse 30. Everybody should be happy I already did the breakdown for you. You're glad about it. <laughs> Money matters. Those verses are verses 4, 15, 22, and 26. And he doesn't already know this, but we're probably going to get Pastor Joel to teach that section because he already talked about in leadership meeting that he wanted to deal with finances. So there you go, man of God. <laughs> yes, the verses for money matters and work ethics, verses 4, 15, 22, and 26. The verses for character are covered in verse 9, 10a, 12, 17 and 29 and I'll repeat that the verses for character are covered in verses 9 10a 12 17 and 29 then for the last theme watch your mouth that's covered in verses 10b 13 14 18 19 through 21 and 31 until the end, which is 32. So watch your mouth. The verses are 10B, 13, 14, 18, 19 through 21 and 31 through 32. Does anybody have any questions regarding the breakdown of the chapter? Okay. So is anybody still ready for the word? Anybody ready for the word? All right, here we go. Okay, so tonight our focus is going to be on theme number one, which is the wise and the foolish. So on your sheet of paper, I want you to make a line down the middle of the page and on the left side, you can put across the top the wise, and on the other side, you can put the foolish. Or if you want to section it off or organize it in a way that is familiar to you, help yourself. Okay, so in chapter 10, chapter 10 outlines several attributes and behaviors of people that are wise and people that are foolish. It provides a point of reference to assist in the judgment of one's character. Excuse me. Basically, verses in this chapter can help us identify if we 
or another is conducting themselves in a wise or foolish manner. So that statement about don't judge me, it's not really accurate because according to the word of God, we can judge, amen? And so chapter 10 is going to show us examples of a person that could be considered wise and a person that could be considered foolish. And it's not us judging, it's the word judging, amen? Okay, so let's start with verse number one. Can I get a volunteer to read verse one, please? And let's read with some energy. Let's read with some excitement. Can I get y'all to do that? Yes. All right. Verse one. The Proverbs of Solomon. A wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. Thank you, Elder Paul. So it says, a wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. So right off the top, it clearly lets us know the difference between a person that is wise and a person that is foolish. So on your paper, as we go through these, I want you to put, break the verse down into the proper section. So when it starts talking about something that is wise, you're gonna write those notes in that section. And then when it starts dealing with the foolish, you're gonna write the foolish characteristics in the foolish section. So it lets us know that a wise son makes their father glad. And I believe that this verse is not only referring to our earthly fathers, but I also believe that it's referring to our spiritual father, which is who? God, Yahweh. For those that have been here for our ministerial, ministerial etiquette classes, um, Elder John has been doing a great breakdown teaching on the whole concept of spiritual father. This whole thing about spiritual father as we know it in Christendom is really not accurate. We really only have fathers in the faith, but we, are, we have one spiritual father, which is Yahweh or God, our father. Now, I know I didn't break it down as eloquent as Elder John, but hopefully y'all still got it, the Zelda Pope version. Amen? Okay, so in verse 1, it says that a wise son makes their father glad. So, again, this is not only just talking about natural fathers, but it's also talking about God. So when we operate in wisdom, that's pleasing to God. Okay? So people always say things like, I want to please God. Well, one way to please God is to operate in wisdom because it lets us know that a wise son makes his father glad. But then it goes on to say that a foolish son, so someone who conducts himself foolishly, and even though it's, it says son, it's not gender specific, it applies to both male and female, okay? And it also applies to all ages, so nobody is left out, amen? So it says that a foolish son is heaviness to his mother, and that word heaviness is translated into grief. So... A foolish acting son, a foolish acting person brings grief to their mother. And not only their, their natural mother, but I also believe that this is talking about Mother Earth. So in the world, when we begin to act foolishly, we are bringing grief to the world. We're bringing grief to our other brothers and sisters. We're bringing grief to the people that are connected to us. Okay, so that's why we have to be careful of how we conduct ourselves because we're not islands to ourselves. Amen. We can't just think that, okay, my one choice is only going to impact me and that's it. That's not true. The choices we make today are going to impact our children tomorrow. Okay, the choices we make today are going to impact somebody that is watching us in the faith. Somebody that's looking up to us can be greatly impacted by our foolishness. So we want to make sure that we are conducting ourselves in a wise manner. And I'm saying we because even though I'm the teacher, it still applies to me too. Amen? Okay? So we want to be wise because conducting ourselves in a wise manner, it pleases God, it pleases our natural fathers, and it probably pleases other people around us. Don't you think it's a lot easier to, to get along in a relationship with anybody when that person is acting right? 
Y'all can talk back. <laughs> and y'all can be real. <laughs> okay? So, again, the wise pleases their father, but the foolish brings grief. So let's go on to verse 2. Can I get a volunteer to read that with some energy and some excitement, please? Verse 2. Treasures of wickedness profit nothing, but righteousness delivered from death. Amen. Treasures of wickedness profit nothing, but righteousness delivered from death. Okay? So, in the wise category... Verse 2 lets us know that by living righteous, that keeps us from dying spiritually. So here we can see an indication of the salvation plan in the book of Proverbs. Because righteousness helps us to escape eternal death. The Bible clearly says that only the pure in heart shall see God. Okay? It goes on to say, be holy because I am holy. It says, holiness without no man shall see God. So we can't, we can't think that we can do anything that we want to do here on earth and think that we're going to make it into the kingdom of heaven. It doesn't work that way. Okay? So righteousness delivers us from death. And when we walk in righteousness, that's showing wisdom. That's a wise thing to do, to walk in righteousness. But then it goes on to say that treasures of wickedness profit nothing. Now, I like the way Solomon brought it down. He called it treasures because if we be honest, some things that are sinful, they're fun. Y'all going to be honest with me tonight? Okay. It seems fun. It seems like a pleasure. It seems like a joy. But guess what? In the end, what does it lead to? It profits nothing. Okay, so think about it. And I, I don't mean to take y'all back, but think about a time when you were not saved. And maybe you were the type of person that went to parties, went to clubs. Okay, you got high, you drunk. That feeling lasted how long? About, okay, one person say about five minutes. Okay, what I'm trying to get is it didn't last long. And then afterwards, what did you have afterwards? After the party and getting drunk and getting high, what did you have afterwards? What'd you say? Use your microphones. <laughs> a hangover, munchies, mm -hmm. a headache. Mm -hmm. Some of your stuff was lost. You didn't know where your stuff was. <laughs> you know? So, again, that's foolish behavior, okay? So even though it may seem good, it may feel good, it may seem like it brings us treasure, in the end, it really leads to nothing, and that's foolish behavior. Amen? All right, so let's go on to verse 3. Can I get a volunteer to read that? The Lord will not suffer the soul of the righteous to famish, but he casts away the substance of the wicked. All right, so right there, again, we can clearly see the difference between someone that is wise and someone that is foolish. For the wise, it says that the Lord will not suffer the soul of the righteous to famish. Famish meaning, you know, never being satisfied or always being empty. When we're in God, when we're using wisdom, that stuff doesn't happen to us because God will always provide for us. He will always make a way. And in Christ, we will find that contentment. We will find that satisfaction in Christ. But on the other hand, it says, but he casted away the substance of the wicked. So, again, it's just like in verse 2. Okay, for a moment, it may seem like what you have in the world is fun and pleasurable and it feels good and it seems good. But you end up losing it all anyway. Think about all of those famous people that have all that money and then they end up committing suicide. You know, or they end up going into bankruptcy, okay? Because, unfortunately, they had it all, but they didn't have the wisdom to go along with it. So they ended up losing it, whether it was through committing suicide or just losing it, okay? So the righteous, excuse me, the wisdom, the wise, 
the Lord will always make sure that they are taken care of. And so the wise people, they will never find themselves in a state where they're not satisfied or they're not content because Yahweh is their source. Yahweh is their resource. Amen? Hand? Yes. Testing. I just wanted to say on that part when you were talking about the wicked, when we are living wicked, it comes along with a price. And a lot of time to the eye of the, even I've heard believers say, oh, man, I wish I had what they had. But the, the understanding of how they got it was a bit, a bit different. They might have killed or uh, they might have stolen. They might have done some hideous thing. They might have sold their soul. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Sold your soul for it. Mm -hmm. And then at the end result, it cost them their life in a real horrible way. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've never, you know, so you've never seen the righteous forsaken. No, he's okay. he begging bread. And he don't have to beg for bread. Mm -hmm. But the wicked, you see him, once, he, once he's in trouble and he's out there, it's a, it's a hard road mm -hmm. of recovery for him. And mo most time, at, in, with the young folk, it ends up in jail because w wickedness calls you to be disobedient mm -hmm. to your parents and call yourself being sneaky doing the other things. That's called wick uh, wickedness, mm -hmm. doing the other things that you know d that you don't do, and it costs you some shame, hurt, then literally can cost you death. Amen. I love the definition that Apostle Anya Hall has for the word wicked. She says that wickedness is being intelligently evil. Mean that, y that you know, you intellectually think out your process for doing something sinful. Yes. Premeditation. Mm. Yes. So, uh, two, two things that came to mind reading these scriptures is one is what profit a man to gain the world and lose his soul mm -hmm. uh, the misappropriation of value or the devaluation of a soul is, is something that we're facing right now because we'd rather live a life that's full of pleasures mm -hmm. than a life that's pleasing unto God and we think and sometimes we cross not, not mature saints but sometimes babies cross pleasure and glory you understand what I'm saying because they think that it, that if I'm pleased and I'm living a good life that's not necessarily so and John uh, John the Baptist as we call him did not live a pleasurable life but his life was pleasing to God and then another thing that we have to look at is is where we're trying to store our reaches no matter what number that you reach on this earth it has a mortal expiration as a mortal expiration Whatever riches that we store up that are heavenly, they can never be dwindled. Do you understand what I'm saying? They only, they, they're exponential. They're eternal. So that's why we have to store riches that are, that are heavenly. How, how do I increase my heavenly uh, wealth or whatever have you? And, and part of increasing your, your, your heavenly wealth comes with wisdom. And wisdom, wisdom that, that is heavenly can help you out naturally as well. Amen. Because he'll teach you and he'll govern you how to live within your means and how to uh to leave an inheritance which is a wise thing which is the bible also in much us as well so inheritance comes two ways not only with not only from a wealth perspective of monetary value but also from a wisdom perspective so how are we building up our spiritual riches how are we becoming more wealthy in the word because we can gain all this materialistic stuff but no matter how much you buy no matter how much you buy that's not going to satisfy your soul. What it's going to do, because, again, we always accumulate addiction uh, to something either narcotic or sexual in nature. And that's not necessarily so. Uh, some people got, uh, you know, shopping addictions. Can't just, you know, gambling. There's all kind of things that you can be tied to where, again, you'll get that quick high. You get that quick high, but it won't be lasting. So we need to focus as believers on things, what is going to last? What is going to, what is, what is going to not only benefit me here while I'm on earth, but, but carry me into heaven? Anybody else? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> the second verse, while it it's very poignant when it says delivereth from, but righteousness delivereth from death. I would wager to say that it's not just death that it delivers from, because when you say righteousness delivers from death, 
everybody gets the idea that if you're not righteous, you might die automatically all uh, right away. Uh, I kind of shortened it in my list of wise things to the Lord, uh, excuse me, living righteous delivereth. Because it can deliver you from whatever your addictions are. It can deliver you from the sins that you are committing. It can deliver you from uncontentment with your lot in life. Because if God is in your life, you're going to be content with what he provides for you. Amen. And that's a beautiful segue into my next point on verse 3. Because it talks about the Lord will suffer the soul will not suffer the soul of the righteous to famish. We got to remember that the soul um, is comprised of our mind, our will, and our emotions. And so it talks about that the Lord will not allow us to be famished in that area. So this also teaches us that wisdom helps us to have emotional well-being as well. Because if we operate in wisdom, we won't, you know, get involved in certain relationships and end up getting heartbroken or we won't, you know, get involved in certain things and end up, you know, failing. And now we feel disappointed and feel like, okay, I failed, I've messed up. Okay, wisdom can help safeguard from all of that. Okay, so it's good to walk in, in, in wisdom because it helps us to be emotionally well. And it also helps us, it delivers us as we talked about in verse 2. It delivers us from our addictions. It delivers us from those things that bring death to our soul and bring death to our walk with Christ. So any more on those first three verses before we move on? Okay, so let's keep it rolling. Oh, let's back up. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 61. Let's put some faith on that. That, that point about wisdom helping us to be emotionally well. Let's look at Isaiah 61, verse 2, starting at verse 2. Well, let's just start at verse 1. <laughs> this is one of my favorite scriptures. Elder Polk even wrote a song about it. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek, he hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. So you see all those references to emotions in those, in those verses? So wisdom, again, helps us to be emotionally well. Walking in wisdom helps us to be emotionally well. Because if we're in God and we're walking in wisdom, he will protect us. He will help us. He will give us that joy. He will give us that peace. He will give us that comfort that we need. Amen? All right, so let's keep it rolling. Yes, ma'am? 61 verses 1 through 4, I believe we read. Okay, let's jump down to verse 6. And can I get a volunteer to read that? We're back in Proverbs chapter 10 for those that, came, that just came in. We're talking about the wise versus the foolish. And now we're on verse 6. So may I get a volunteer, please? Blessings are upon the head of the just but violence covers the mouth of the wicked. Amen. Blessings are upon the head of the just, but violence covers the mouth of the wicked. So that's pretty simple. Wisdom helps us to be blessed. Yes, sir. Um, I just wanted to point out something. I don't know if, I don't know if you've seen it or not, but mm -hmm. I see a crown and I see a muzzle. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't see it, but go ahead and elaborate. Young Be minister. <laughs> <laughs> I see a crown in the muzzle in verse 6 uh, where it says, blessings are upon the head mm -hmm. of the just. Mm -hmm. That means that's what you're adorned with. Yes. You're adorned with blessings. And then it says, but violence covereth the mouth of the wicked. Mm -hmm. So everything 
that's coming out of your mouth, mouth is violent or evil or whatever have you. And it's intended to be um, opposing to, you know, what God is doing or whatever have you. So I see a muzzle and I see a crown. Amen. That's good. Thank you so much for sharing that. So clearly we see the difference between a wise person and a foolish person in that verse. The wise are going to be crowned with blessings and the foolish, they always have violent things coming out of their mouth, as Minister Marcel so greatly explained. Let's go on to verse 7. Can I get a volunteer to read that? The memory of the just is blessed, but the name of the wicked shall rot. Amen. What this is talking about here when it says memory is reputation. So the reputation of someone that is wise is blessed. People think good about a person that walks in wisdom. But those that are wicked, they usually have a bad name for themselves. They usually have a bad rep. And either way, the reputation will precede them. Have you all ever heard that statement before about the reputation preceding a person? Most of the time that is true. And think about it, when people hear your name, what kind of thoughts do you think come to their mind? Is it good thoughts or bad thoughts? That's something that all of us should think about. And I know, I, know you, I know we live in a time and in a generation where people say, I don't care what people say about me. It don't matter what people have to say about me. I get it. But do you really want to walk around with a bad reputation? No. I wouldn't. If I knew that, you know, bad things was being said about me and there was some truth to it, I would want to do something about it. And then vice versa. If I got a good reputation, I want to continue in that vein. Amen? Yes, sir. I just wanted to just make this point. Uh, and that's in verse number seven, said the memory. Uh, oftentimes, uh, when we go to a funeral, and there's a, a book we have at home and that, that's been published called What Happened Between the Dash, from the time you were born to the time you would die. There's been a lot of people who speak about either how well you are, how well you did, but very seldom they'll speak the evil. They'll tell the good parts, but they won't tell the evil part. So, but, but the truth is, between the dash, what happened in your life between the time you were born to the time you died will memory to that person, people. Because they're going to remember the, the good as, bell, uh, as, as well as the ugly. But if the good overpowers the ugly, that's what they're going to remember the most because those bad things doesn't matter anymore. Mm -hmm. So what happens with our life, so I would say to even to us, watch what we're doing between the time we were saved until we die. <laughs> Amen. Yes. I think in a strange way, for lack of a better terminology, this generation desires haters. Because they seem important. The more haters they, they, I got. The more haters that I accumulate, the more important that I am. And the more people that hate on me, it must be because I'm doing something right. Well, let me change that. Well, let us try and help change in that thinking. When Christ walked the earth, it said that he was esteemed of God and man. But what we'll do is we'll see a scripture, some of us, this ain't to everybody, this only to them intelligently evil folk is that we'll, we'll see something and we'll try and turn around because the Bible clearly says that we will be hated of all men, right? We'll be hated of all men. So because we don't have the revelation or we don't have the study to understand that when it's talking about all men, it's talking about carnality. That's what it's talking about. It's not saying that you literally going to be hated by everybody because you should never be hated by a true believer. That should never happen. So if a true believer is hating on you, well, you're probably looking at them from the wrong perspective anyway. And most likely, most likely there's something going on in you where either you desire that or you're doing something where you're trying to make something self-righteous. Because when we do something, we want it to be right. We want everybody to see what's righteous about us. 
and not what's true about us. You know what I'm saying? We don't want anybody to tell the truth about us because if they told the truth about us, then we're going to have to change something. And many, many of us are very, very opposed to change. When you tell somebody to change something about itself, most people are going to throw up a defense mechanism. Why? Because change is conflict. Because it's going to bring a difference, very simply. When you change, something must be different. And everybody is not going to agree with the difference that you make. But like believers, true believers should agree with that. So you shouldn't be accumulating haters that are believers. And so, oh, because, you know, we'll get into that whole, I don't want to go off, off topic, but we'll get into the whole that they can't receive me. And they don't receive my gift. They don't understand my anointing. Well, maybe it's because your anointing is actually tainted. Maybe it's because you own that wild oil, you know. Maybe, <laughs> maybe that's what that is. So what I'm saying is we can't, we can't look at haters as a good thing. Yes, are some people going to be against you? Yes, we understand this. But if enough people are saying the same thing about you, you might want to do a little self-examination and say, you know what, maybe that's who I really, or maybe that's what I'm really portraying out to people. Because whatever you consistently display is who you actually are. If you can, again, we've said this so many times, if you consistently do something, if you continue, if you continuously sin, yes, we are all sinners. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God, but we don't practice sin. You practice sin, well, then that's your occupation. Amen. That's right. Amen. Okay, so let's go on to verse 8. So we clear on verse 7. That's talking about reputation, and the wise usually have a good reputation, and the foolish don't. Now, verse 8, can I get a volunteer to read that, please? The wise in heart will receive commandments, but a prating fool shall fall. Okay. So the wise in heart will receive commandments. Okay. So it's good to hear and receive instruction. And not only instruction, but also constructive criticism. Okay. A wise person will receive constructive criticism. They won't put up the defense. Now, there is a difference between destructive and constructive. And a wise person will be able to discern between the two and reject the destructive and receive the constructive. Amen. <laughs> yes. I just want to rephrase that just a tad bit. All right. All right. So you have destructive criticism. Mm -hmm. Then you have constructive correction. All right. Because criticism is criticism. Mm -hmm. and if you criticize somebody, you criticize them. And there ain't no way around it. All but right. you can correct somebody mm -hmm. without criticizing them. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So sometimes when we criticize somebody in a phrase that I'm trying to use it in. Not that it was incorrect, but in the tone mm -hmm. that we think of criticism. So I, I've never thought of criticism as a positive thing. I don't know about you, but that's just me. I've never said, but correction, I can receive correction mm -hmm. as a positive thing. Again, we think about the word constructive itself. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're building something, okay, you put the mortar, uh, you put the mortar inside of the brick. Yes. All of the mortar doesn't make it into the building. Mm -hmm. To make sure that that thing seals right, you got to scrape some of that mortar off. That is the correction of the construction. It's not a criticism. I just need to get this out so when they put the paint or the stucco on the building that it actually lays flat and that it actually looks the way that we intended it to be built. But I have to scrape this other stuff, this access off. But, uh, you know, so you can't be opposed to somebody scraping the access off. That's correction. Criticism is just sitting there pointing and telling something, look at the mud, look at the, look at, look, it's, dri it's dripping. Because that, that's, that's what we do. It's, we don't correct anything. We just talk about it. That's what we, that's, that's what many believers do. We just talk about it. Oh, 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 her shoes, not that trip. I'm just looking at you. Oh, her, her, one of her heels is uneven. One of her, one, why don't you raise it up? Why don't you make a correction instead of a critique? Amen. Yes. And then, Elder. One of the things that uh, our pastor will do in the leaders meeting quite often is say, don't bring something to me without a plan. To criticize is to throw something without a plan behind it to correct it. To correct is to let them know what they're doing wrong and how to correct it. They're two different things. Amen. Yes. 
uh, okay, not not going against the grain, if you will, but, you know, since I heard a previous teaching on the difference between constructive and destructive criticism by a really good-looking guy, about six feet, about 240, um, I just want to uh, make sure that there's an understanding on what's meant by that. In order, when, when we look at criticism, as Pastor explained, 99 times out of 100, we go for the negative connotation that's involved with the word. When the word critic is, is simply, you have to go to the root of the word. The word critic is the root word of criticize, which is the extension, if you will, uh, criticism. A critic, by Merriam-Webster definition, is one who expresses a reasoned opinion on any matter, especially involving a judgment of its value, truth, righteousness, beauty, or technique. There is a such thing as constructive criticism, but we have to make sure that it is not a tearing down. That's where we get the destructive criticism, where we're, all we're looking at is the negative. All we're looking at is what we can do to say something bad against somebody. That's destructive, whereas if you're looking at it in a, in a way to help, to help build, when you look at the word constructive, what's the root word? Construct, extension of construction. That's build up, and that's the opposite of destruction. So you have to understand the difference between what's been said here. Yeah, there's a such thing as constructive criticism, and then there's a such thing as destructive criticism, just to bring clarity to what she's trying to teach here. Amen. Yes. And if their perception of how they, you are actually bringing that message to them, it still can require, uh, it still could be turn, pertain to being criticism or something negative. Because when we hear the word critic, critique, correction, 99, like you said, 90% of the time, we're going to look at that as a negative connotation. So I think that the way we, we present it to that person, and then you really have to have that relationship to really know how to because some people are not going to take it, the correction. If you say it's correction, then they're going to look at it where you're still looking down on me because each word actually brings a negative connotation. Amen. I, I don't want to belabor that point, and I, I, I definitely i am in agreement with what both things are saying because the, the meaning of the word is the meaning of the word, and she's correct uh, with saying how we uh, receive a thing. But, okay, let's just look at it from a vision standpoint. Right? What kind of lenses do you wear when you don't see, right? This is what I'm getting at. So, uh, or what we're, we're trying to say. So we're saying the same thing. We're saying the same thing. It's up to you to have the discernment to know how to speak into somebody because we can give all the definitions that we want to, but it's how we speak it, and you have to have that relationship because it's going to vary for each person. Somebody's going to receive criticism. Somebody's going to receive correction. Either way, they ha something has to change. Something must be made different than what it is. So again, um, just very briefly, I was talking uh, to a friend of mine about how we say things. I said, it's funny how you say, if you say faith teaches us, watch how they receive it better than the Bible teaches us. Same thing. But when you say the Bible teaches us, now you Bible bashing. If I say faith teaches us, it's just a reception point depending on who you're talking to. Faith teaches us, faith teaches us this. If you say faith, I'm telling you, I've actually seen this work, so it's not something off the top of my head. Saying faith, faith teaches us, all of a sudden, everybody's receiving, because it's just faith. Everybody has, everybody can um, register or relate to faith in some regard. Everybody has it. Everybody has it, but when you say Bible, same thing. The Bible is what? Faith. But the word and its reception of the word, so I, I get the point, but what I'm saying is, is, is when we're speaking to people to be in a, what you spoke about a couple of Sabbaths ago, being that effective witness, to be an effective witness, okay, what vernacular, what articulation is going to reach this person so that I don't bring an offense when I'm trying to instruct? And that's why we always make sure that when we do something, I don't care if I had the complete right intention. That's regardless. My thing is going to be like, I meant, if I, even if I think that you received it in the wrong way, I'm going to be like, I mean no offense. So that already gives me the cushion of what I'm telling you. I don't mean to offend you in it. I'm trying to help. So, but again, just to, 
to get through that point, uh, again, agreeing and wrapping everything into one so there's no, uh, there's clarity here and there's no, the, the word criticism mean what it means. That's the word whether you like it or not. That's, you know what I'm saying, whether you like the way it sounds or not. But again, we can't go to what somebody likes or not. We have to look at their reception point, how they're receiving it. So you can say, okay, yeah, the word means this, but if they didn't receive it, what good did you just do? Amen. Thank you, everybody, for sharing. Those were all excellent points. Now going to the second half of that scripture where it says, but a prating fool shall fall. The word prating, if you look it up, you'll see that it means babbling fool. One who always runs their mouth. This type of individual will end up failing because they are always talking and never listening. Okay? So that's an example of a foolish person. Always have something to say, always running their mouth, but never having an opportunity, never taking the opportunity to listen, hear, receive, and apply. Okay? If you just take a few moments to just listen to somebody, you'll be able to tell where they are. You'll be able to tell what's going on. Just listen. Just listen. That's how the Bible instructs us to be swift to hear and slow to speak. And that's one of the differences between someone that's wise and someone that's foolish. If you're always talking, when are you listening? When are you hearing? When are you receiving anything? If you're always putting out, putting out, putting out, always got something to say about any and everything. Yes. I mean, my grandfather used to always say, you got two, <laughs> there's a reason why you got two ears and one mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Okay, let's jump down to verse 16. Can I get a volunteer to read that, please? The label of righteousness tendeth to life, the fruit of the wicked, I'm sorry, the fruit of the wicked to sin. Amen. The labor of the righteous, meaning the work or the behaviors or the things that the righteous or the wise people do, it always leads to life. In other words, people that are wise are into production, doing things that produce life, okay? But on the flip side, those that are foolish or wicked Everything that they do leads to sin. Let's take a look at Galatians 5 and 19 through 21. Just to give a little bit more faith on that. Galatians 5, when you have it. Say, I'm there, I got it. Okay, we're going to start reading at verse 19. It says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, so it's not like the people hadn't heard this, because he's basically saying, okay, you don't already heard this before. As I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay? So foolish acts, foolish behavior leads to sin. It leads to the works of the flesh. Yes. Uh, uh, if even if uh, it's beautiful that you came here, but like if even if we go down a little further, there's another separation, just as uh, Proverbs is doing. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, God. I mean, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. So there's your separation of that that foolish and the, and the righteous right there as well. Amen. And we can go ahead and add that to our wise section because, yeah, people that walk in wisdom, that are righteous, they do produce those fruit. That fruit, excuse me, let me say it accurately. They do produce that fruit. Joy, love, peace, long-suffering, patience. Everything that's listed there should be flowing from the righteous. Amen? Um, 
just to give a, uh, another translation, God's words translation reads verse 16. A righteous person's reward is life. A wicked person's harvest is sin. So you're going to produce fruit one way or another. Amen. We're always producing something. Amen. And as righteous, we want to make sure that we're producing the fruit of the spirit. Because the wages of sin is what? But the gift of God is eternal life. All right. So let's go down to verse 23. May I get a volunteer to read that, please? We can have repeat readers. That's fine. It is us sport to a fool to do mischief, but a man of understanding has wisdom. Amen. Okay. So foolish people, they're always playing games. It says it's like a sport. Okay. They're always doing mischief. Okay. Let me stick to my notes here so I don't get, get too far from where I want us to be. Okay, so verse 23, it is a sport to a fool to do mischief, but a man of understanding have wisdom. Earlier, a couple weeks ago, we were in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7, and that scripture says, let's go there. Proverbs 4 and 7 says, wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. So someone that is wise is always trying to seek this. They're always trying to learn more. They're always trying to gain more wisdom. They're always trying to gain an understanding. But on the other side, those that are foolish, they're basically practicing sin. They're playing games all the time. They're doing things that are not productive, engaging in foolish activities. Yes. Um, I, I don't know why, why I saw it like this, but... Um, right there, I just seen like a, a a single guy, a single guy, who have made a sport out of being with women. Amen. And a lot of times, you, you hear the to the term said, you know, oh, did you score? Or I scored, you know, whatever have you, because they made a sport out of getting with other women. Mm -hmm. But then you see a man that understands how this works and how God wants it to work. Mm -hmm. So there's your there's wisdom right there. So I don't, I don't know why I saw it like that, but that's how I saw it like that. So. That's good. Good analogy. Amen. Anybody else? You sure? <laughs> you got that look. <laughs> okay, verse number 24. Let me go back to chapter 10. Okay, 24. Proverbs 10 and 24 says, The fear of the wicked... It shall come upon him, but the desire of the righteous shall be granted. Someone find Psalms 37 and 4. And whoever gets it, if you could please read that first. Psalm 37 and 4. Psalms 37 and 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Amen. Okay, so those that are wise... God will give them the desires of their heart. He will give them what to desire, the things to desire, so that he can then turn around and bless them. But the wicked, whatever they fear, that's what they shall receive. It says the fear of the wicked, it shall come upon him. So whatever they fear, it will manifest in their life because they lack the wisdom to make choices that will lead them to abundant life. So again, there's a difference between the wise and the foolish. Verse 25. Can I get a volunteer to read that? And when the storm has swept by, the wicked are gone, but the righteous stand firm forever. Amen. Another indication to the salvation plan. When you're wise and you're in Christ, it leads to life. But when you're engaging in foolishness, sin, it leads to death. Verse number 27. 
The, the fear of the Lord prolongeth days, but the years of the wicked shall be shortened. Amen. There it is again. Okay. So what is the secret to the fountain of youth? Wisdom and being in God. There's a scripture that says he beautifies the meek with salvation. Have you ever seen someone that's older, but they still look so beautiful? We have an example here. <laughs> look at Bishop and Pastor Catherine. Don't they look good? Amen. Okay. But then on the other side, have you ever seen someone that's, you know, been in so much sin and so much foolishness, even though they're young, they look very aged. I've seen people, and I was surprised to hear them say that they were in their 20s because the sin had put so much age on them. You know, drinking, partying, clubbing, doing all of that stuff. They're in their 20s, but they look like they're 40. Okay? And sin will do that to you. It will, it will, it will take away your life. It will take from you. But wisdom, righteousness, it will add to you. It will produce life. It will increase you. Let's look at verse 28. Volunteer, please. The hope of the righteous shall be gladness, but the expectation of the wicked shall perish. Amen. So when you're in God, the things that you're hoped for creates an expectation. And expectation leads to manifestation because expectation stirs up your faith. And we know what the word tells us about faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. With faith, all things are possible. Okay? So this is how the wise conduct themselves. They walk by faith and not by sight. They have their hope and their expectation in Christ. And because of that, they experience the manifestations of God's blessings and favor and glory. And we already had a lesson on favor, so we know that favor is fair. And if we meet the requirements, be wise and meet the requirements, we can experience the favor of God. Yes. I just want to just expound the word hope. And according to the word of God, said that every man that has his hope in him mm -hmm. purifies himself even as he is pure. So that means that that individual has that hope of eternal hope. That's the hope that we that are believers should have within ourselves. So in, in have the hope that we must be uh, cleansed by the blood of Christ. Mm -hmm. Amen. Anybody else? Just a general reminder that our hope does not oscillate. It does not uh, project itself as the Western concept of hope is. Because when you say, I hope this happens, that, you know, saying from a Western mindset, it's an open ended thing that if it doesn't happen, you're, you know, saying you might be okay with it, slightly disappointed. But when we say that we hope, our hope does not oscillate. Our hope is based on upon a promise. So all we're doing is await, our hope is awaiting manifestation. It's not, you know, saying there's no, there's no, there's no way that when God has bringing us to his expected end, that we're expecting failure. We don't expect failure in our hope. We expect manifestation. So when we say our hope, all we're in is in the process of, you know, saying awaiting manifestation. That's what our hope is. It's awaiting manifestation, not this, uh, if it doesn't happen or, you know, I, it may not happen. It may not happen this way. Oh, I hope it happens. It's not a questionable thing. It's an assurance. Amen. And we've got one more verse, verse 30. It says, the righteous shall never be removed but the wicked shall not inhabit the earth. Another reference to the ultimate plan of salvation. This is also dealing with things that are discussed in the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because we know that after the rapture and after everything that's supposed to take place after the rapture, we're going to reign with him forever, for eternity. So the wise or the righteous, we won't perish. But the foolish, mm, we know what's going to happen to the foolish, right? <laughs> okay. So tonight we have just gone through chapter 10, and we pulled out the verses that talked about the wise, and we pulled out the verses that talked about the foolish. Now I do have a few discussion questions. The first one is a true or false question. 
Well, it's not even a question, it's a statement. And I want you all to let me know if you feel like the statement is true or false. So the statement is, unapplied wisdom is foolish. Is that true or false? Amen, that's right. Unapplied wisdom is foolish. What good is it to sit here and receive wisdom, receive the teachings of the Lord, and don't apply it? That's just foolishness. <laughs> yes. It goes back to that question that was on my mind, the difference between wisdom or being wise and understanding. Because you can know a thing, but if you don't apply it, then you're not really understanding what it means to you. And there are a lot of things in the word that we can read and maybe even quote, but do we understand what it's saying? Right, because you can't apply something that you don't understand. You gotta get the understanding and then you can apply it. And all you're getting get what? Understanding. So when you get, you're, you're trying to get understanding, but let's not mistake understanding with choice. You can understand a thing and choose not to do it. That's right. You can hear God's word and choose not to do it. You can receive wisdom and choose not to utilize it. So it's not that necessarily you don't understand. I understand your question. But I just want to make it clear that let's not mistake understanding with choice. Because sometimes we have an understanding. We not maybe don't want to give credence to it or don't want to pay attention to it. But I'm talking about for those of us that do have an understanding of something, let's just make it something simple. I understand that that box is orange. But I can choose to call that box green. Now, that's foolish for me to call that green. Good example. I can choose to do that because I have free will. I have choices that I can make. Mm -hmm. So what we do, what the fool does, what, what a fool does is he chooses to remain in foolishness. Mm -hmm. Because if you want to be, if you desire wisdom, the way that God operates is that he'll give it to you. Yep, you have that. to not, not desire it. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Because his whole, again, we go over some points that we've covered before. His plan is to give you the information. Mm -hmm. You won't even return to what? The, the gospel is preached throughout all the world. That is his, his salvation plan is so that everybody has the opportunity to hear. He has, he's, uh, he's bound to his word, so to speak, that everybody has to hear the gospel. The gospel is what? The good news, the wisdom, the knowledge of Christ. That is his design. Now, once that's out there, you have a choice what you're going to do with it. Amen. So, but what I'm saying, it's a little different than what your question is, but what I want to make sure is that we understand there's a difference between understanding and choice because some things we understand and we choose not to do. But now if we don't understand, if we seek understanding, then understanding will be made it to us because at first, like, whatever, name a subject, name a subject that you had difficulty with. Doesn't matter whether it was math, doesn't matter whether it was science. Doesn't matter what subject matter it was. Once you really sought an understanding, you will begin to gain an understanding. I'm not saying that it's going to happen immediately. But once you seek an understanding for something, if your heart is really in understanding that, it doesn't matter how difficult it may be, you'll get an understanding. I didn't say that you'll become an expert, but you'll have an understanding. May it make sense? Yes. All right. Next question. What can we do to help a sister or brother in the faith that is displaying foolishness? <laughs> what can we do to help a sister or brother in the faith that is displaying foolishness? Yes. I think the first, the first thing is to know them that labor among you. Um, know what you can say to a person. Know if you can say something to a person because a lot of times we see things that happen and we're not the people to be able to tell them because we understand that we're not at a point to where they'll receive us or vice versa. They're not at a point where they'll receive us. So I think that's the first thing. But if we are able to to approach them in, in a way to where it's helpful and they can receive, I think um, we should always direct them to the word and say, this is what God says about this. Now, now that you know, you are held accountable for it and, um, and let God do the rest. That's good. Anybody else? I just want to biblically back up my statement. Mm -hmm. James 1. 
and uh, verse 5, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally. If you want wisdom, wisdom is attainable. So the only reason that you don't gain understanding is because there's something rooted in your heart that really doesn't want it. You know what I'm saying? So understanding wisdom is available if we truly desire the thing. The key word is the truly part. If we truly desire it, then, I mean, it says it here in many other places, but this is the one that is used very widely. If any man lack, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God that give to all men liberally and upbraid if not, and it shall be given him. So it said it shall be given to you if you ask of God. So there's no reason for you from a spiritual perspective not to have an understanding. Amen. That goes back to one of the chapters we were talking about, and the question was, can you pray for someone to get wisdom? And we came to the understanding that really, I mean, you can pray, but really the way, the only way they're going to get it is like the scripture says, is they have to ask God for it and they have to seek out for it themselves. Amen. All right. Anybody else had any helpful ways on how we can help a sister or brother that is displaying foolish behavior? Because the word says that we are helpless one to another. Yes, ma'am. I think that we need to go with the approach of love. Yes. Because I don't think some sometimes people might not realize that they are doing foolish things because it has not been revealed to them. Yes. I say, so we go to them in love. Amen. And I think that's one of the ways to approach a person who is doing foolish things or are doing things that are not wise. Mm -hmm. Because depending on where the culture or whatever whatever dictate what they are doing, mm -hmm. then it might not it, is, it, it seems foolish to to us, mm -hmm. but not necessarily foolish to them. So I think in anything that we do, we have to approach it with love. Amen. Definitely. Also, I just want to use the scripture with what, what I'm about to say. In First John 1 11 it says, and he did Jesus, and he came unto his own, and his own received him not. So even though there are some good things that we said, people may not ever receive you. So right. you have to be careful. And we're not responsible for the reception. We're not. We're just responsible for making sure that we obey Yahweh and what he tells us to do when he leads us to go minister to people or to, to speak in love to people. But we, we're not responsible for their reception. I right. saw a hand over here. Yes. No, I just want to make sure that, like what she's saying, in love, whatever had you, if, if like the postman, if you are, because we're messengers, right? Each and every one of us are messengers. We're supposed to be able to deliver the message of the gospel. Now, you don't want you don't want to receive a box that's raggedy and beat up. Right. All right, you don't, and you don't want it to be shoved in your face either, do you? Mm -hmm. So we can't approach people with the gospel like that because oh, we so deep, or oh, we know so much Bible that now we're just chastising people or whatever. Hey, or just just again, just bring it to here. Take this. Mm -hmm. I don't want it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So if we do that approach with love thing and we give it to love again. Love is, uh, part of love is correction now. Part of love is correction, but there's a way that we must do it and present to that person because, again, once we've, once we've delivered the, the package in love and we placed it at that person's, in that person's hands or at that person's doorstep, it is up to that person to receive it. But we've got to make sure that we deliver the package the best way that we can. We can't just deliver it in any old kind of condition and then be mad that the person didn't want to receive it or what a return to sender. Amen. Minister Marcel and then Minister Erica, and then we're going to wrap up. Um, I, I think uh, one of my favorite uh, things to say in our, uh, and one of my favorite perceptions now concerning <clears throat> um, what we consider to be babies or, you know, um, new converts or whatever have you, is a lot of times they come into church, and because we've been here so long, we, we look at them or we look down on them. Well, we tend to as a people. We tend to look down on them as they come in and not realizing that we were there at one point, you know, and it took us time to get to where we are and that, you know, it wasn't an overnight process. So one of my favorite things to, to say now is we're going to love them to the next level because, because when, when, you, when, when you approach them, like she said, you know, we got we to gotta approach them with love. This is how they're going to know that we're of Jesus Christ. That's, this is the principle. So it's like we have to be mindful of that and, and make sure that, you know, we don't just try to jack people up as soon as they come into the church because they're going to run back out right away because they're not used to that. They can get that. Well, they are used to that. But what's the sense of coming into church to get that when they could have got that out in the street? You know, so we have to be mindful of how we handle people because, I mean, 
If you're doing it in love, love is God, and God don't do anything out of order. So. Just don't mess me. Truly has just messed me up with that. Anyways, um, Galatians 6 and 1 is enough to say what you say to a foolish person that's within the body is that, you know, you go to and says, my brother will be took in a fault. It's still a fault. Restore him in the spirit of meekness. Um, what do you, another thing I say about myself, say the loving them to the next level just says where we're going, higher. And that thing just missed me. Amen. So the last thing that I want to conclude with tonight is, of course, you know, we don't, want to focus on other people. We also want to take the time out to do self-evaluation. So um, your homework is to take your notes and I want you to evaluate your own life. See if there's any foolishness in your life. And if so, then those are areas that we should commit to try to work on. If there's areas in our life where we are displaying wisdom, let's maintain that. Let's be consistent in those areas. If there are some checks on the wisdom side that we haven't checked off yet, maybe let's try to work on those things and be in that way because we are going higher. So because we're going higher, that means that we are growing and we should be doing more in Christ. So that's what we want to do over the course of these next few days until we get back next week is we want to make sure that we also evaluate ourselves and see if there's foolishness that needs to be dealt with or if there's some wisdom that we need to gain and apply. Amen? So thank you all for being a part of Bible study on tonight. We thank God for our online viewers, and we do encourage you to tune in on this Saturday. We will be right here Saturday morning at 1030 a.m. for our morning Sabbath worship service, and Pastor Joel will be bringing forth a, a, a message that seems to be exciting. I can't wait to hear it. It's called... This is uncalled for? That's uncalled for. That's uncalled for. Okay. <laughs> All right. And so we will also be back here on next Thursday to continue in Chapter 10. Um, I believe that pastor is going to pick up on that lesson because it's going to be dealing with money and work ethics. So at this time, we ask you to stand to your feet and receive to your fortune.